Every day, people are astonished by the fact that there's nature in New York City. As the birds fly across one of the most developed cities in the world, oh, there's woodlands, there's water, there's habitat. We can go roost in the ramble. That same thing is played out across the city in parks famous and not so famous. In late 1979, the city had fallen on dire financial stress. There was no money for maintenance in the parks, and including the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. There were abandoned cars in it and debris all over the place. Parks were wastelands across the city, including Central Park and Prospect Park. There were a thousand serious crimes a year in Central Park. And yet, there were certain groups of people who were in the parks anyway. It's people who were not scared. The birders were one of those groups. We'd meet within sight of the boathouse and uh, get together, particularly during the spring migration. Year-round, there were regulars. The ramble wasn't maintained. It was sort of benign neglect. It had grown to be very hospitable to birds. The Parks Department was engaging a private organization to do a survey to restore Central Park. They wanted to restore sight lines between objects and uh, Vistas. When they started cutting down mature trees, we went into action and started a letter writing campaign and a petition to the Parks Department. They really stood very firmly against the initial plans of the Conservancy to renovate the Ramble, which would have cut out all the naturalistic planting material, gotten rid of a lot of habitat. That was crucial. At that time, there were 7,000 National Audubon members who lived within the zip codes of New York City. So we thought it would be a natural for us to uh, get together and create a local organization. We got together, about 30 of us um, at that time. These people took a leap of faith as birders into bird conservation, and they built an organization designed to save birds in New York City. A lot of the early work was intended to push the parks and the conservancy people, make Central Park a good place for birds. They depend on this place in migration, make it worth their stop. The National Park Service wanted to turn Floyd Bennett Field into an amusement park. We wanted to keep it as a place for sparrows. So the local birders at Floyd Bennett Field engaged us to try to advocate for them, and we did that. I really have to credit uh, New York City Audubon with being a, a, an absolute pioneer in enlightening people about the importance of nature in New York City. And playing a very important leadership and education role in enlightening city officials as to the value of natural habitat. They helped create an entirely new ethos toward land management. Everything is concentrated here. Uh, we're located along the Atlantic and Hudson River flyways. We have a big salt marsh. We have a record of 340 species of birds documented in Jamaica Bay. In 1990, we had no ospreys in New York City. And we now have 25 nesting pair in Jamaica Bay. So it's a real success story. Audubon started a program called Buffer the Bay in the early 80s back with uh, the Trust for Public Land. Surveyed all the remaining open space around the bay, categorized it, prioritized them according to ecological values, and then proceeded to try to get them transferred from one city agency to parks. There were these islands, these wetlands that were either privately owned and subject to development or um, owned by other city agencies and also subject to development. There was this sort of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to assess, uh, define priorities for, and acquire and protect these lands forever. Living in New York City, there's constant pressure for change, for development, uh, so we have to be constantly on our guard. New York City Audubon is important to the health of this ecosystem because they developed partnerships early on with the various city agencies as well as other environmental groups. The result was thousands and thousands of acres of wetlands that could have been developed and destroyed were protected.
We got a budget sufficiently large enough to pay somebody, so we hired a, an executive director. In 1993, I was the first executive director and the first employee of New York City Audubon. This group of people had fought some really uh, hard environmental battles and uh, they had won. So I was reassured by their feistiness. I found the yellow bird on the sidewalk and I couldn't conceive of what it was doing there. Birds are attracted to lights when they migrate at night and they can become disoriented and confused and wind up slamming into buildings. It was in 1997 that I decided to actually start doing something about it myself. I worked downtown and so I would go around the buildings of the World Financial Center and the World Trade Center looking for birds that had hit the windows. And I would record on a map where I found each victim. The idea was to try to identify particularly tr problematic spots. First year I found 413 collision victims Nearly 300 of them were dead. I reported on my findings and put out a call for volunteers. Ned Boyajan was the very first person to volunteer. We realized that a lot of the strikes were happening right at that 30, 20 minutes before dawn. And we would call it the witching hour, actually. The birds that had been lured to light settled down in trees or whatever bit of shrubbery they can find and then come morning, they are prone to flying into the reflections that they see in the windows. Maybe they see the habitat inside a, a lobby and they just go and they just strike, 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 strike. It could be very emotional work, it could be very draining. With that data, we were able to go to building managers. The folks who own the World Trade Center, the Port Authority, were extremely receptive and actually put up nets along one of the bases of World Trade Centers that the birds would bounce off of rather than collide. We put those nets in in the summer of 2001, just before migration started. Ed Strauss of the World Trade Center was in charge of real estate and properties and he was the one who worked with us to put up that netting. He was among those who died on 9-11. It's kind of hard to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and keep going, but we shifted our focus to Midtown. We would often have conversations with folks who would see the birds and want to know what we're doing, so we had opportunities to talk to them. Very grassroots and educate folks about the problem. People are listening. All we need to do is make glass visible to birds. We now have legislation before the city council to require bird-friendly design on buildings. To the extent that the city will begin to do the right thing, 100% of the credit goes to New York City Audubon for that. The Harbor Herons program is designed to survey all the islands in the New York Harbor, you know, up through the East River, all through Jamaica Bay, and hop in and swim Rhode Islands off the Verrazano. We have uh, great egret, snowy egret, black crown eye herring, glossy ibis, and cormorants nesting in all these uh, islands. We wanted to study them and see how they're linked to what we humans are doing to our environment. So every year Audubon comes and, you know, does a complete survey of them. So we get a long-term record of the population statistics of these birds, which is important for preserving them. This population survey work has been ongoing for the last 34 years. Herons, the ibis, the egrets, these birds are considered to be climate threatened, which means that where they're nesting or foraging, that habitat is at risk for climate change people turn to us and ask us, what's the trend, what's going on? And our data are solid. We've been collecting them the same way year after year. And we have a lot to say. Each year on September 11th, New York City Audubon monitors the Tribute in Light Memorial. Our community science folks are up on, up on the roof counting birds in the beams. 
every 20 minutes. So our monitoring of the Tribune in Light really shows the power of partnerships. We tell them when there's too many birds in the lights and they turn the lights out for about 20 minutes or so. And when we turn out the lights, the birds move on. This was a, a groundbreaking event. <laughs> that this, uh, this, this predator bird would all of a sudden inhabit a high-end building on Fifth Avenue. Bits and pieces of rats and squirrels and sometimes nesting material it fell off the nest right onto their uh, nice formal entrance. And this offended the shareholders of that building. One day without us knowing it was happening, they took down the nest and people were horrified. There was a huge hue and cry. People carrying signs and pictures of pale mail and marching on the street and police were there. And that's when we went into the building and talked to the president with E.J. McAdams, executive director of New York City Audubon, Adrian Banapi, who was commissioner of parks, and John Flicker, who was the president of National Audubon. We were allowed to come in through the service entrance and meet in the room full of employees' tools to explain to the co-op board of directors why they should really pursue a different tack than trying to evict this world's most famous red-tailed hawk. I had no authority over it. Audubon had no authority, and yet we asserted the authority. We went in there and said, you know, we represent the Lollipop Guild, and you are violating the law. We were able to persuade the building to put up this metal kind of nest, and this captured all the material that might fall off the nest onto the entrance to this important building. This was just a win-win for all. And that really put the name of the organization kind of in the forefront, uh, that people would suddenly read the articles about Pale Mail, see New York City Audubon's name, and say, oh, there's actually an organization in the city that works to save birds and bird habitat. The National Wildlife Refuge in Jamaica Bay basically has two ponds. It has an east pond, which is a saltwater pond, and it has a west pond that was set up as a freshwater pond. When Hurricane Sandy hit, it tore a breach through the west pond and basically drained it, filled it with salt water, and was subject then to the tide. It destroyed a lot of the plants around the edge, and no birds would come. New York City Audubon got upset. They said, let's do something about it and see if we can get them to restore it as a freshwater pond. And we met almost every week, uh, at least every two weeks for about two years. Just working with all the other organizations and being the lead in it and having those organizations, was the Brooklyn Birding Club or Linnaean, all look to New York City Audubon for the leadership in this area it was very satisfying. It meant we were doing something right. Well, now it's closed, it's uh, quiet water, so there's no tidal influence there. So it's a nice resting spot for birds. It was a clear victory for the coalition and a clear victory for New York City Audubon. The Jacob Javits Center is an interesting case study for us. We first learned about the Javits Center from Project Safe Flight. It was a, one of the worst bird killers that we monitored in the city. And then the building was up for renovation. The lead architect, Bruce Fowl, uh, is an incredibly forward-thinking person who figured out that not only could he save energy by using different architectural designs in the building, like fritted glass and low reflective glass, but he could also prevent birds from flying into glass. And he did. And Bruce designed a green roof for the building. And the green roof has a lot of environmental properties, but it also it's habitat. With the support of Javits, we've been able to launch the Green Roof Researchers Alliance, which is a group of scientists who study the biology of green roofs across New York City. None of this would be possible if we hadn't had creative and brave minds like Bruce Fell and Alan Steele at the Javits Center. The success of that building, not just being bird friendly, but being 
sustainable and environmentally embracing and the way in which it promotes itself for those qualities. That's the kind of building that every building in New York City should be. It's, it's an American Red Star. The work that was done in the 80s and in the 90s and into the 2000s really brought together a community of people who cared and who wanted to have an impact and wanted to make sure that birds were part of the future of New York City. We have a lot of volunteers who go out there in the hot sun on a July day planting uh, marsh grass in the middle of Jamaica Bay. Tagging horseshoe crabs or cleaning up beaches. Willing to do whatever it is to make this place a little bit better. In recent years, New York City Audubon has been very involved in educational activities. Our objective of doing more free walks is really about bringing more people into the conservation conversation. Our future rests in being an organization that represents the entire city. Yeah, yellow-bellied sapsucker. <laughs> I've seen them once or twice. Yeah. They've been a constant. They've been there to be the spokespeople, to be the advocates. They are the Lorax, in effect, of, of the bird world. Uh, they speak for the birds in the trees. Their, their work protected Jamaica Bay. Their work protected the Ramble in the Northwoods. Their, wood, their work inspired the proper restoration of the woodlands of Prospect Park and the protection of the shorelines and the wetlands around New York City. And we're here to make a difference, to follow the footsteps of the people that came before us, to implement solutions for birds. This is serious business. 